New York Times has new reporting this morning about the inquiry led by special counsel John Durham. Durham was appointed by then Attorney General Bill Barr back in 2019 to look into the theory that the investigation into Donald Trump's 2016 campaign ties to Russia stemmed from a conspiracy by intelligence and law enforcement agencies. The Times reports that after nearly four years, Durham's work is coming to an end without uncovering anything like the deep state plot alleged by former President Trump and suspected by Bill Barr. What the Times did find after a months long review was a quote, strained justification for the opening of the inquiry and its role in fueling partisan conspiracy theories that would never be charged in court. Instead, the Durham probe became, quote, roiled by internal dissent and ethical disputes as it went unsuccessfully down one path after another, even as Trump and Barr promoted a misleading narr narrative of its progress. All really significant as we look at the totality of our coverage today, Willie. And joining us now is the co-author of that new report, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and Washington correspondent for The New York Times, Charlie Savage. Charlie, good morning. This is an extraordinary piece worth everyone's time to, to read through it. Um, I guess let's start at the beginning. This, was, this investigation lasted nearly four years, far longer than the Mueller investigation itself. It was the investigation of the investigators. But as you all write in the piece, it was based on conspiracy theories. And John Durham, it seems, knew relatively quickly that none of these theories could have been tried, prosecuted, or certainly won before a jury in court. <clears throat> well, it began because Bill Barr came into office in February of 2019, having already decided that there must be some kind of intelligence operation lurking in the origins of the Russia investigation. So that's before he had access to any briefings or anything that he hadn't just seen on Fox News or read in the newspaper. Uh, and this, so that is the basis by which he set John Durham in motion. And Durham and his crew spent a year, the first year, primarily looking for evidence to back up that hunch. They went through the CIA's files uh, for a long period. They, uh, Barr and Durham together traveled both to London and to Rome to talk to allied intelligence officials and government officials uh, chasing conspiracy theories that there had been some kind of in intelligence op uh, targeting the Trump campaign and just came up with nothing. And so by the summer of 2020, the original animating basis of that investigation uh, had reached a dead end, yet they did not close up shop, uh, but turned to a new uh, justification that is hunting for a basis to accuse Hillary Clinton and her campaign for the fact that Trump came under suspicion for collusion with Russia uh, in order to keep going. And now it's been four years. Well, you just alluded to it, Charlie, about how directly involved the sitting attorney general, Bill Barr, was at the time, that he took specific personal interest in this, that he did travel, as you said, around the world working on this. How unusual was that to see an attorney general this involved in an investigation like this? Very unusual. Typically, in a the attorney general has a lot to do. The attorney general does not run individualized investigations, and in particular, politically sensitive investigations, the sort of thing that become special counsel investigations like this one. Most attorneys general try to keep that at, at arm's distance. They do not interact directly with the investigators on a routine, day-to-day -day basis, and sort of become the co-runner of that investigation. But that's what happened here. Hey, Charlie, good morning. Jonathan Lemire, certainly Burr's, uh, Barr's extraordinary involvement is a major headline here. And you write that in one of his trips to Europe, to Italy, uh, they talked to officials there who largely discounted the Russia conspiracy stuff, but led them to another tip, a criminal investigation into suspicious financial dealings related to Trump himself. My eyebrows raised when I read this in the story last night. Uh, tell us more about this tantalizing piece of information. That's right. Well, we came across several things that would be, let's call, eyebrow-raising uh, disclosures or revelations, and that's one of them. So we, they went to Italy in the fall of like, early fall of 2019, chasing a particular pro-Trump conspiracy theory about uh, that maybe someone involved in the early stages of the campaign, uh, the investigation, had been uh, an Italian intelligence asset. Italian, Italian officials told them, no, you're wrong. That's all just crazy. 
But if, since you're interested, here is this other thing. And this other thing was a tip that uh, an allegation of some kind of international financial crimes related to Trump himself, having nothing to do with the Russia investigation. And so now they have this very awkward piece of information that they weren't didn't go there looking for, but have had dropped into their laps. And they decided, Bill Barr decided, that rather than having Durham refer that to another prosecutor, because it had nothing to do with his mandate at looking at the Russia investigation, Durham would keep control of it himself. They decided it was too credible and too serious to simply ignore, but they would have Durham investigated. And so Durham opened a criminal investigation involving Trump himself, an extraordinary moment that was kept secret until now. In fact, it leaked in the fall of 2019 that his administrative review had evolved to encompass a criminal investigation. But everyone thought that that must mean he had found some kind of criminal wrongdoing or suspicion of it, uh, a predicate for thinking there was something there by the people who looked at Trump in Russia. And the Justice Department let that impression linger. In fact, they were investigating stuff involving Trump himself, 180 degrees the opposite of what everyone thought was going on at that moment. We don't know more about that at this point. We don't know what he did. We don't know what level of investigation it was. We don't know what he found out. We do know that Durham chose never to bring charges involving that matter. Uh, Charlie, I think we all want to know more about that. Uh, what was this tip? What were the alleged improprieties by uh, involving Trump? And why didn't uh, where did Durham get with it? Uh, and maybe we will find that out at some point. But there are, there are other sort of jaw-dropping moments in your great story, including uh, that Durham at one point became obsessed with getting the emails of some aide to George Soros, which is kind of a sure sign that they're going down a rabbit hole when they start ranting about George Soros. But um, that a judge twice said, there's nothing here, this is ridiculous, uh, go away. And uh, rather than take that answer twice, he, he went to a grand jury so he could uh, pursue this information that apparently apparently led nowhere. Did, did Durham essentially go completely off the rails in terms of normal prosecutorial uh, process, normal Justice Department process uh, in this case? I have talked to a variety of prosecutors and put to them the question, have you ever heard of a prosecutor who twice was rejected by a federal judge for in getting what is called a 2703D order for information about emails by a judge ruling that their evidentiary basis to intrude on an American's privacy was too thin to grant that order? And instead of then accepting that and moving on, used grand jury powers to get direct access to that information anyway. And every single person I put that to was like, I've never heard of that before. That's extraordinary. Uh, you also write about uh, Nora Danahy, uh, the number two in this investigation, who sort of resigned a little bit mysteriously. We never heard a full explanation of why. And now in your piece, uh, it is revealed why, that she was under some pressure to release kind of an interim report that would be damning in some way to Hillary Clinton, to the FBI. And it sounds like she refused to do that. Uh, I was close to that. She she had had a series of ethics, prosecutorial ethics disputes with Durham, it turns out, and the first of which was that she wanted Bill Barr to stop talking about their investigation in line with Justice Department principles and asked Durham to tell Barr to stop, and he was unwilling to challenge the attorney general. The second being she opposed that step we just talked about, using a grand jury powers to get information a judge had said they lacked a legal basis to obtain about a George Soros aides emails. She opposed that and then told aides that Durham had done it without telling her. And then she came across a interim draft report in September 2020 that she had not known was in the works that uh, Barr had pushed Durham to produce. And he had had other people on the team draft up and uh, she exploded. There was a big argument in front of other people uh, in which she said that that it was inappropriate to issue a report before an investigation was done, definitely inappropriate to do so before an election. And the report contained some dubious information that it took at face value. And she uh, sent then an email to people in the investigative team outlining those concerns in greater detail and quit the next day. 
So that is, is what happened in September 2020 when Durham's longtime colleague and number two and deputy on this investigation abruptly quit. Well, Charlie, we'll uh, end with this excerpt from your report, quote, a year into the Durham inquiry, Mr. Barr declared that the attempt to get to the bottom of what happened in 2016 cannot be and it will not be a tit for tat exercise. We're not going to lower the standards just to achieve a result. But Robert Luskin, a criminal defense lawyer and former Justice Department prosecutor who represented two witnesses, Mr. Durham interviewed, said that he had a hard time squaring Mr. Durham's prior reputation as an independent-minded straight shooter with his end-of-career conduct as Mr. Barr's special counsel. This stuff has my head spinning, Mr. Luskin said. When did these guys drink the Kool-Aid? And who served it to them? We'll leave that right there. Washington correspondent for The New York Times, Charlie Savage, thank you very much for being on this morning.